What's going on? Ventric here. Welcome back. So today I want to talk to you about large tournaments, uh, setting expectations, what to expect, and generally how they run. When I was at the Energon Invitational on the weekend, there were quite a few Transformers players who didn't really seem to understand or grasp what was going to happen when they showed up for this tournament. Um, after the fact, there was a lot of posts on Facebook, Reddit, whatnot, about people complaining about the length of the tournament, uh, that they didn't get lunch breaks, dinner breaks, the lack of food. Um, so I guess they came with a certain set of expectations. For those of you who were there, you now know what to expect. But anybody who comes across this video and will be playing in a future large Transformers event, I want to give you a brief, brief rundown on what to expect, how to set your expectations, and how to perform your best at one of these large tournaments. Uh, so um, to begin, let's go over um, what you need to know going into the tournament. You're going to want to know the tournament rules for the game or any specific rules for the game that will help you play. Uh, these can be found at https colon slash slash wpn.wizards.com slash en slash resources slash rules documents. Um, when you go to that web page, what you're going to see is a web page, and you're going to see this chart kind of in the middle. It's not going to be on Transformers. It's going to be on all. You're going to want to click on Transformers, and then you're going to see four documents currently. There's the uh, Transformers TCG deck checklist. This would be a um, where you would fill out a deck list uh, this is generally going to be for your local store if you're doing a competitive event there. Uh, for the larger tournaments, there was online registration, so we wouldn't have to worry about this. But if they are accepting paper deck lists, you can print it out here, fill it out ahead of time. One less stressor when you get to the event. Uh, the next one down is the Transformers TCG Tournament Rules. This is your codified set of rules for the tournament. It's going to explain all the different rules, interaction, things that will happen in the tournament, at least what Wizards has codified. And so it's great to read this over. It'll give you a good understanding of what's going to happen. I'll go over a bit more of these in depth a little bit later on and some of them in future videos. Uh, the next one down is the basic TCG rules. Um, if you're here and you're playing the game and you're thinking about doing organized play competitive, then you probably already understand the basics, so no real need to look at this. And then the Transformer TCG FAQ, this is basically just a bunch of the rules roundups all put into one place, um, question and answer, so you can understand how certain interactions work with certain cards. Uh, going forward beyond that, there are basically, in Wizards of the Coast games, um, we'll take Magic for example, there are two different types of rules enforcement level. This is like how strict the judges are, how apt you are if you miss something to be able to take it back, if you make a mistake, what the punishments are. Um, in Magic, there's the um, regular rules enforcement level, um, which in Magic is governed by the JAR, which is judging at regular. Um, there's nothing really codified for this for Transformers, but this is just more your casual learning environment where people are helping each other to try and learn the game. Uh, this is where you're going to be playing Transformers at your local store. It's probably what you're used to, your kitchen, a little bit above your kitchen table, but if you're playing a local store in, I don't know, like a Wednesday night drop-in, you're probably just going to be more casual, judging it regular. You might not even have a judge, but if you do, that's what they'll be following. And then there's the competitive slash professional rules level enforcement. Uh, and in Magic, this follows what is known as the infraction procedure guide or the ipg if you want to see that you can click on the magic the gathering tab on the website um and you can look up the ipg it'll give you an idea i'm um, going into the energy invitational this is one of my biggest worries um just to put everything out there i am a level one magic the gathering judge in good standing i have been playing competitive magic on and off for the last 23 24 years uh, I've played in big tournaments, I've played in small tournaments, I've played in casual tournaments, I've judged big tournaments, I've judged small tournaments, I've judged casual tournaments, I have judged um, competitive tournaments. So I've seen this from all around and I know what to expect. I've pretty much seen most things and um, have had to deal with it, whether it's as myself or um, with other players. So uh, competitive, it's codified in the IPG and it's also going to be in this Transformers TCG uh, tournament rules. There are a few of them codified there, but then some of them say, uh, like, um, infraction 
as required or up or even one of them even says like refer to the IPG. There isn't one for Transformers. I spoke with Matt Tabak, the um like the rules advisor. He's in charge of rules for Magic the Gathering and Transformers. And he basically told me that Transformers is currently would be using the IPG. Um, if you if you were at the tournament, you would have realized that a lot of the judges there didn't really understand the rules of Transformers. There is no judge program for Transformers. So they were all magic judges and they were trying their best, doing their best. They can only do it so much. They don't understand the game as much. So they're going to try to follow this, this, this infraction procedure guide because it sets out a set of rules for how they interact with the players and whether they give out warnings, game losses, match losses, disqualifications, so that it, it is the same across the board. It should be no matter which judge takes your call, uh, they should follow this guide. They're not allowed to deviate. Um, the only person who can deviate is the head judge, and it is not recommended that they do. That way they don't become, well, the other judge said I can do it this way. So judges should follow this guide um, letter by letter, and everybody should get an equal experience, whether you're playing at Gen Con, Origins, or PAX, you should expect the same thing from the judges. So it might be good to take a look at that or just understand the main thing, read over the Transformer basic rules. I'm going to go into depth in future videos, breaking down the IPG and how I feel that it uh, translates to Transformers. So now that we've kind of walked through the different levels, again, larger events are going to be at competitive. Um, things will be more tightly tightly watched. Let's just put it that way. So moving on. So so you're going to this big tournament. And in the case of the Energon Open, we knew in advance that it was going to be nine rounds. Now, there are some, some settings that, depending on the size of the tournament, the number of rounds should be set. Um, so this is for players, a four player tournament only requires two rounds to have one undefeated player because after one round you're going to have two undefeated players, after two rounds you're going to have one undefeated player. So generally Swiss is set up to come down to one undefeated player. Sometimes you do Swiss plus one uh, just to make things a little bit more interesting. Uh, but as you can see as we go down, five day players, three rounds, 90 to 16, four rounds. 17 to 32, five rounds. 33 to 64, six rounds. 65 to 128, seven rounds. 129 to 226, eight rounds. Now the Energon Open had 159 players. So you would think it should have been eight rounds, unless it was Swiss plus one. Uh, the reason I believe it was nine rounds and why that was brought up ahead of time was because 300 players were qualified. So they may have been expecting to be in that 227 to 409 range. So they, they advertise nine rounds. It's always better to have more rounds than less rounds because then you're going to get into these crazy tiebreak situations for top eight, which we're going to go over in a little bit. Uh, so there you go. So And then the 410 plus, you're going to be playing not 10 rounds, sometimes more. But this is just the basic um, general guidelines for how many rounds are going to be the tournament. So if you're going to a tournament and you're expecting 17 to 32 players, set your expectations that it's going to be five rounds with a cut to top eight. Uh, if you're doing 9 to 16, it's probably going to be 4 rounds with the cut to top 4 if we're doing that. Uh, so when we get into talking about cutting to the top 8, uh, they're going to go by what's called match points. Uh, a win is equal to 3 match points, a draw is equal to 1 match point, and a loss is equal to 0 match points. And the way Swiss works is you're always going to be paired against somebody with the same match points as you, unless there's an odd number, and then you're going to get what's known as pair-ups and pair-downs. Where someone at, say, say someone is 3-0, and they have 9 match points. Wizards Event Reporter, which is the software, is going to attempt to pair them against somebody else with 9 match points. If we get an odd number, so you have 9 match points, and then there's someone else who's like 2-0-1, so they have 7 match points. One person is going to get that pairing, so the person with 7 match points is going to be paired up. The person with 9 match points is going to be paired down. And a loss, of course, is worth 0 points. So now that we've seen... Um, the number of thing, the number of rounds per player. We're gonna try to figure out now. You want to set your expectations. So, how long is this tournament going to take? In the case of the Energon Open, it took 12 hours. A lot of people were complaining about how long it was. Other people were complaining about there was no lunch break or there was no dinner break. So, 
it took exactly as long as I thought it was going to because I've been in a number of these and I understand how these tournaments work and I'm going to walk you through that so you can set your expectations going into the tournament. So my tournament length estimation around is 50 minutes. That's codified. Each round is 50 minutes. Turnaround, 10 minutes is what I put in there. What turnaround is, is the time it takes from the time the last slip goes in till the time the pairings are printed, posted on the board, and the players are seated and ready to begin the next round. I have that at 10 minutes. Then average overtime is the amount of time the average round is going to go over. Now, the the more players you have, the larger the chance is that somebody is going to go to time and have to go into extra turn and, and a match procedure. But in a large tournament as well like this, there were deck checks happening. There were judge calls happening. Anytime a judge call lasts longer than a minute, the judge needs to give you a time extension. If they do not give you a time extension, request a time extension. Um, you deserve it. And it could be the difference between winning and losing the match when the time when time runs out. If you really need a couple extra turns, a five minute time extension might get you there. Now with deck checks, um, the goal of a judge is to try and get a deck check done within seven minutes. That's from the time they take the deck from you to the time they return it. Now, as part of the deck check, the judge will sort your deck. So they have to give you an additional three minutes on top of the deck check time in order to give you enough time to re-randomize your deck so that you're not clumped up when you show if you don't randomize it properly you're just gonna you're gonna get weird draws so the average time is 10 minutes so in any given round someone is going to have a 10 minute time extension now that match may not go to time if it doesn't go to time then the extension gets washed away but if it that match does go to time they have an additional 10 minutes before they go into the tiebreak procedure so i'm just kind of rounding that Average overtime, 15 minutes. From my past experience, sometimes it can be more. Some Magic GPs, there's rounds that have gone a half an hour, 45 minutes, based on the way that they work, how slow the turns go. Again, if you're in overtime, this is no excuse for slow play. You will can still get a warning. Um, so, yeah, it's no excuse to slow play when you're in overtime. You're just affecting the entire tournament. So, at that point, so those are my... my my, my estimations for those. Now we knew there was three rounds of sealed deck in this tournament. And so a sealed deck, you get 20 minutes for your opponent to register, open your packs and your opponent to register your deck. Then you get 30 minutes to build. And then we're gonna say the 10 minute turnaround. So that adds another hour. So where we're at right now is nine rounds. One round plus turnaround plus overtime is 75 minutes. So nine rounds times 75 minutes is 675 minutes. It's 11 hours and 15 minutes. We add our sealed registration plus build plus turnaround another 60 minutes. So my projected tournament time going in was 12 hours and 15 minutes. So the tournament started at 10.30. I was expecting it to run until 10.30, 10.45. I believe the top eight announcement was made around 10.30. So the tournament ran at about the exact time I expected it. So all of these people who were complaining about how long it was, if they would have had this information ahead of time, they could have set expectations. So now going in, knowing that this tournament is going to be a 12-hour tournament, you need to plan ahead. Uh, you need to make sure that you're properly hydrated. Bring water with you. Bring snacks. I brought, for that day, I brought three bottles of water. I bought a, brought a bottle of Gatorade. I brought a bag of these nut clusters, just like cashews, almonds, uh, that I bought at Costco. I brought chocolate. I brought fruit snacks. I basically had enough stuff in my bag because, to be honest, a lot of my games went to time. And between rounds, I had a couple of minutes, enough time to run to the bathroom. I didn't have time to go looking for food. There was one match all day where I had time to like go to the convention center. I had about 20 minutes, half an hour, because I finished a match quick, to actually go out and explore, and I would have had time to maybe grab some food. Also, convention food is expensive. So if you can pack a lunch, pack a lunch. Bring it with you. Eat it on the go. But just make sure that you are prepared. And again, I heard some people saying that they wanted a lunch break, a dinner break. Think about it. It took 12 hours without that. You add those in, we're looking at 14 hours. The term's not over till after midnight. And when you're in a large convention, or even a, a store, a, a store's rented a hall, a hotel banquet room, they have rules. Like, they want you out the door. So, packs, I think, closed at, 
I don't know what time it closed at, 11 o'clock midnight. So all the tournaments had to be done before then. They cannot run over. If they're running over, they're going to be getting kicked out the door. And then where does that leave us? So that's the reason why, like, no large magic tournaments, there's no dinner breaks. You need to come prepared. And one thing, like, if you say there's not enough time to go to the washroom between, between rounds or something, call a judge. The judge will never say no to you if you need to use the bathroom. Call them over. Say, I need to use the bathroom. They will allow you to do that, and they will give you a time extension. Uh, the, the only caveat is you have 10 minutes. If you take longer than 10 minutes, you will get a match loss because they don't want people dilly-dallying. So when you call them over and say, I need to go, they will say, okay, you have 10 minutes. If you're longer... Uh, that's your bad, but try to be back as fast as possible. So that's a, that's one thing. The food, the water, make sure you have it. And again, when it comes to judges, your opponent may be the greatest person in the world. This is a competitive event. There's a lot of money on the line. They do not have your best interests at heart. So if they can try to get an advantage, if you're willing to listen to them, maybe they're telling you the truth. But if you are not sure, call a judge. They are impartial. They will. They are on your side. So, like I said, your opponents do not have your best interests at, at heart. They want to win. Everybody wants to win. Somewhere deep down inside, they want to win. So just remember that. Don't be afraid to call a judge. And another thing, you are entitled to appeal it should be announced at the beginning of the match that at the beginning of the tournament uh that you have the right to appeal any judge ruling that is given to you if you do not believe it is correct ask for an appeal and an appeal will be granted another thing at the start of the tournament they're always going to do at the start of the tournament i kind of missed this earlier is a player meeting it's really going to sit everybody down uh, now, this serves two purposes. One is to give out swag. If they have swag, they're going to hand it out that way. Um, if they're collecting deck lists, then the, they seat you alphabetically. So the deck lists will be alphabetical. They won't have to sort them. Now, what I saw at this Transformers event was a bunch of players sat down for the player meeting, but they thought it was round one pairings. And they opened their decks. They started shuffling. And some people at my table, I had to tell them, uh, this is the player meeting. If you notice, we're alphabetical. This is not your first round. You, you can put your stuff away because you're going to be moving. So, yeah, don't look like a noob. Be ready. And uh, definitely do not pull your deck out and start shuffling for the player meeting because everyone's going to look at you like you don't know what you're doing. So so come in with this, this knowledge at hand. One pro tip, player meeting is not your first round pairings. All right. So now that we've gone through that, we've gone through the player meeting. Um, I've gone through the number of rounds. So you're playing and you hear, maybe you hear people talk about, well, cut to the top eight, IDing into the top eight. Um, so I'm going to give you an idea of kind of how that works. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up the round eights. This is, these are the standings after round eight at the Energon Inf Invitational. So if you look here, Adam Bixler, 21 points. Daniel Arnold, 21 points. Stephen Pickney, 21 points. Aiden Downey back, 21 points. Richard Wire, 21 points. And we got Daryl Chavez at 19 points. So all these 21 pointers are 7 and 1. Daryl Chavez is 6 1 and 1. Jimmy Jan and Down, those are all 6 and 2 at this point in time. So when they talk about cut the top eight and IDing into the top eight. So Transformers has removed the unintentional draw, but you can always ID with your opponent. Anytime you can offer to intentionally draw with your opponent and you get one match point. You both get one match point. So at this point in time, when you look at the standings, uh, these top five players are all at 21 points. The only person who can pass them, if they can all ID, they all go to 22 points. The only person who can pass them is Daryl Chavez. So an ID guarantees them a top eight spot. They don't have to risk anything. If they play to try and get number one rank and someone like Richard here with 55% of opponent's match win percentage loses, then he's out of it. So what actually ended up happening, um, I will show you the, the round nine stand, the round nine standings after what happened. So what ended up happening was Adam Bixler got paired up against Aiden Downey back. They sat down. They're both at 21 points. 22 points gets them in the top eight. They intentionally drew. Daniel Arnold got paired against Stefan Pickney. Same thing. 21 points. 22 points get you in. They ID'd. Then we got down to Richard Wyatt. 
and he got paired up against, I believe it was Daryl Chavez. So he got the pair down. So what happens here is an ID gets Richard Wired into the top eight. An ID does not get Daryl Chavez because an ID gets him to 20 points. These 18 pointers are lurking. If they win, they pass him. So Richard had to play Daryl. And given Richard's match win percentage, as you can see, Richard won his match. He went to 24 points, got the first seed. If he would have lost that match, uh, you look down here, number nine, Scott Landis, he has a better first tiebreaker. So there's, there's tiebreakers in Magic. Once you get the same match, so first, first breaker is match points. If you have the same match point, your first tiebreaker is opponent's match win percentage. So in this case, Scott has a way better opponent's match win percentage than Richard. So if Richard would have lost his match, um, Daryl Chavez would have been the number one seed. Everything else would have fallen in the places it was. But the eighth seed would have been Scott Landis. Uh, but it looks like, yeah, the eighth, the eighth seed, well, may or may not be Scott Landis. It all depends, but that's the way things kind of went is is in the end, Richard had to win that match or he was out of the top eight. So he wins the match. And then as you can see, um, William Gomez, Jimmy Gian, Ian Wall all won their matches. So Ian Wall, William Gomez. So Jimmy Gian and William Gomez stayed in the top eight, but Ian Wall took Chavez's spot because he lost. And so that's how we got our top eight. And again, opponent's match win percentage, first tiebreaker, game win... Your game win percentage is second tiebreaker if the match win percentage is the, is identical. You're not really going to see it in a large tournament. You might see it in a small tournament. Then it goes down to opponent's game win percentage finally. Uh, so there you go. So that was how things broke down. Now, once you hit the top eight, um, you're wondering, like, how do players know who they will be playing? So there's a bracket. First always plays eighth. Fourth plays fifth. Third plays sixth. Second plays seventh. So in this case, Richard Wyatt played Ian Wall. Ian Wall won that match. He moved on. Fourth and fifth, Stefan Pickney paid Aiden Downey back. Uh, Stefan won. He moves on. So now Stefan will be playing Ian Wall. Ian Wall won. He goes on to the semifinals. Move down to the bottom half of the bracket. Third versus six. Daniel Arnold played William Gomez. Daniel Arnold won. And then we got Adam Bixler in second playing seventh Jimmy Jan. Jimmy Jan won. So then we got, we get into Daniel Arnold, played Jimmy Jan, Daniel Arnold won. So now in the finals, we had our number three seed, number three seed Daniel Arnold, playing our number eight seed, Ian Wall. Uh, Daniel Arnold took it down, won the tournament. Another thing in the top eight, during the tournament, um, who goes first is decided by a random thing, a coin flip, a, a uh, rolling the dice, even or odd, high number. In the top eight, whoever the higher seed is chooses whether to go first or second. So with all the top seeds getting knocked out early, uh, Daniel Arnold had like his choice the whole way through of whether he wanted to go first or second, which was a great advantage. So I think I pretty much covered everything. Expectations, what to bring, and how to take care of yourself. Uh, I hope this was informative. I hope this helps people. If they were at the Energen Invitational and they may not have noticed some of this, it helps them out. Or people who are planning on going to future large events, I hope this helps you out. Once again, I'm Ventric. This is Transformers TCG. And uh, that's that. That's a wrap.